Good morning, class. This week we will be working in the Reader's Adventures magazine. I believe most of you have pictures up from the school, and I did send emails to parents requesting that they pick them up. If your parent hasn't picked that up yet, it's okay. They can get to it when they can, and you'll see the way I created this lesson. You can actually see each page as we go through it. So if you don't have your Reader's Adventures, your Reading Adventures magazine, that's okay and we won't stress about that. You can follow along this way. If you do have your Reading Adventures magazine, I would like you to make sure that you have your book with you. You open it up and you follow along with the stories as we read them in your book. The Reading Adventures magazine introduction. It says, Welcome Reader. In this magazine, you will read about animals from the distant past and from right now, including a fish that lives in both times. You'll explore a cave of crystals, a palace in a cliff, and a prehistoric tar pit. Don't get too close. You'll read poems and stories about fossils and mysterious deer, and travel even farther in a lot of fun activities. Your journey to discovery begins when you turn the page. This week we will be working through Lesson 26, and in the Reader's Magazine you will see that it includes a short Reader's Theater. It, re it includes our anchor text, which is called Animals on the Move. And then it, we have a few activities. We have a poetry place with our Reader's Magazine. We have an activity central, and this week the activity central is Animal Match and Wild Simile. And then we have a section called Your Turn, and that's called Wild Traveler. We are going today to work through the Reader's Theater, which is Sky Woman's Rescue, and we are going to work through our anchor text, Animals on the Move. You will see as well that we have in our book the poetry place, the whale, or end the poetry place, the geese. We have the Activity Central Animal Match and Wild Similes, and the Your Turn Wild Traveler that we will work through in the coming days this week. You will notice our Reader's Theater this week is called Sky Woman's Rescue. The setting is it, the dark, watery world below the sky. And the characters, we have a narrator, turtle, toad, otter, goose one, goose two, and sky woman. Normally, in a classroom situation, we would assign characters and different people would read the different sections for the characters. However, in this situation, being it's the first read, I'm going to read them all, which I don't expect it to be super engaging, but I would like to try during our class meeting to read it as a class where I will assign the characters to people who are interested in reading, and we will try it together, the Sky Woman's Rescue piece. You also will notice that normally you don't say who who is speaking when you are reading a Reader's Theater, in this situation being it's the first time that we're reading through, as well as the fact that not everyone has picked up their text. I am going to say the character name before I read that section to you. Okay, setting. The dark, watery world below the sky. Narrator. The animals living below the sky led a peaceful life. Toad, should I swim or should I take a nap? I'll nap. Narrator, but one day two geese flew down with news. Goose one landing in the water. Guess what? Sky woman dreamed about a hole in the clouds and her dream inspired the chief to uproot the great tree. Toad, too bad. I liked that tree. Goose two. Now there really is a hole in the clouds. Otter peering upward. And Sky Woman must have fallen through, because here she comes. Turtle. Geese, can you fly up and catch her? Geese. We can and we will. They fly off. While the geese took off into the sky, Turtle thought about what to do next. Turtle. Sky Woman will need some place to land. I doubt if she can swim. Narrator. Turtle tilted her head, pondering. Finally, she came to a decision. Turtle. Toad, swim down and bring up lots of mud. Toad. Mud? 
If that's your plan, turtle, as much mud as you can carry. Hurry. Narrator. Toad dove into the water. Meanwhile, the geese circled lower and lower with Sky Woman between their wings. At last, Toad came to the surface. His mouth bulged with mud. Turtle. Good. Now you and Otter spread the mud over my shell, good and thick. Otter. Spreading the mud. This will make a nice soft landing. Narrator. Just in time, the geese came down on Turtle's back with Sky Woman. Sky Woman. Thank you, noble animals. You rescued me. Toad. No problem. Hey, you have seeds. Sky Woman. Yes, I grabbed them from the great tree as I fell. She scatters the seeds on the mud. Narrator. The seeds took root. Soon the mud became the earth, thick with plants and full of new life. And later, Sky Woman gave birth to twins. They became the first people. Toad. All because of me. Toad exits with a splash. So as I read through this text, one of the things I'd like you to be thinking about is when you're reading a reader's theater piece and there are characters, it flows so much more smoothly and makes a lot more sense to a listener, especially to a listener, when it's different characters or different voices playing the different parts, as well as when I was reading it, I did tell you who was reading because some of you don't have the text, but that even kind of breaks up the reading and kind of takes away um, the fluid piece of reading. It chops it up a little bit. Uh, it's an unnecessary piece of information when you have those speakers in place. So not my favorite way to read a reader's theater, but a way for everyone to get the information today and we will try and do the Reader's Theater together as a class during our class meeting after the lesson. I'd like you now to turn your page to Animals on the Move. Um, Animals on the Move is our anchor text this week for Lesson 26, and it's a pretty cool text. I enjoy this text, so if you'll make sure you're following along in your book as you go. If you don't, do your best to follow along with the video. Animals on the Move, Leaving Home. On a warm summer day, a tiny striped fish wiggles out of the gravel of a riverbed in North Calif Northern California. For the next few months, this young Pacific salmon, called a fry, explores the section of the river where she was born, feeding on insects and plants. Then instinct, knowledge, she was born with, tells her to swim downstream. Tumbling over rocks and through rapids, the salmon finally reaches the mouth of the river where, she, where it meets the sea. Salt water and fresh water mix, and the salmon spends a few weeks feeding on small shellfish as she doubles in size, loses her stripes, and turns a shining silver. Then the young salmon travels out to sea, swimming for thousands of miles into the ocean. In a few years, she will find her way back across the ocean and up the river to the exact section where she was born. How can she do this? Animals have five senses, just as people do. Sight, hearing, touch, taste, and smell. To navigate, they use these senses and other abilities that people don't have, such as echolocation, in ways that scientists are still trying to understand. At the bottom, you can see I cut it off a little on the picture, I'm sorry, but it says, these sockeye salmon are returning to their home to spawn or lay eggs. Elephant talk. Elephants trumpet when they are excited or alarmed. Mother elephants hum to their newborn babies. But people who study elephants have noticed something odd. A herd might be grazing peacefully in the African grasslands. Suddenly, they all lift their heads, flap their ears, and begin to walk together in the same direction. They may walk for miles and then meet another herd. The elephants greet each other with loud trumpeting calls, flapping their ears and twisting their trunks together. It's a gigantic family reunion. How did they find each other? The elephants didn't see each other. If the wind was not blowing the right way, their sense of smell didn't help them. Scientists were puzzled. Dr. Katie Payne solved the puzzle when she recorded elephant sounds at a slow speed. She listened to the tapes at normal speed and heard elephant sounds no human had ever heard before. 
They were deep rumbles, too low for our ears to hear. But elephants could hear them from miles away. Scientists call this infrasound. Sound moves in waves through the air. Low sounds like the elephant's rumbles move, along, move in long waves that can travel many miles. So elephants rumble back and forth to find each other. The caption under the picture. Elephants travel together in groups across the African plains. They follow infrasonic calls their relatives make. Sounds too low for human ears. Why bats squeak? Bats also make sounds that humans cannot hear. But these sounds are not rumbles. They are high-pitched squeaks. Bats use these squeaks and their excellent hearing to find their way in the dark. They do so through echolocation, using echoes to locate something. If you make a loud sound in a large empty room, you will hear that sound come back to you as an echo. Echoes are created when sound waves move through the air, hit something, and bounce back. All sounds move in this way, bouncing back if they hit a solid object. But human hearing is not good enough to hear most echoes. Bats, however, do hear these echoes. Bats make their squeaking sounds as they fly through the dark in search of food. The squeaks bounce off trees, houses, and other objects. This is useful in finding prey because echoes even bounce off insects. Amazingly, these bouncing echoes tell bats how far away the insect is, which direction it is moving, and how fast it is flying. Bats can even tell how fast and juicy the insect is. Echolocation is important to bats because insects are their main source of food. Sound waves from a bat's squeak bounce off an insect and travel back to the bat as an echo. In this way, bats can find their dinner. Why bees sing and dance? Honeybees work together in a hive. Young bees work inside the hive. Older bees go outside to gather pollen and nectar from flowers to make honey. At first, they make dozens of short flights to learn the lay of the land. Next, they learn the direction the sun appears to move. Finally, they fly as far as three miles from their hive to gather pollen. Bees use their sense of smell as well as eyesight to find flowers. They use the sun to find their way home. On cloudy days, they look for landmarks they have learned. Back at the hive, they offer nectar they found to the other bees. Then the bees dance. Sometimes they move in circles. At other times, they zigzag or waggle. Beekeepers have long known that bees dance, but it was not until 1947 that scientists discovered why. When honeybees dance, they are telling the other bees where to find food. Researchers also discovered that the sounds bees make while dancing give information about finding flowers. The bees need the whole song and dance routine to learn how to return to the flowers and get nectar too. A honeybee's circular dance means flowers are nearby. A waggle dance signals that the flowers are farther away. Bird maps and compasses. It is easy to get to places you've been to many times before, but traveling a long distance or an unknown route takes more planning. A map and a compass are often helpful for such trips. The map shows you how to get from one place to another. The compass can tell you in what direction you are moving. Every year, hundreds of species of birds take long trips too. They fly hundreds and thousands of miles from one home to another. In the fall, they fly to warmer climates where food is plentiful all winter. When spring comes, they fly back to raise their young where they were born. For a long time, people wondered where the birds went and what routes they took. Researchers now know that migrating birds, such as cranes, are guided by their own sort of maps and compasses. But it has taken many decades to uncover the secrets of these navigation tools. In the 1800s, scientists started putting bands around a bird's legs. The bands contained a name and an address. When people found the banded birds, they contacted the person named on the band and told the tracker where and when they had found the bird. In this simple way, scientists learned a lot about where birds traveled, where they stopped, and how fast they moved. 
Today, scientists still put light aluminum bands on birds' legs. They also use new ways of tracking birds. Airplanes, computers, tiny radio transmitters, and satellites. Scientists have answered many questions about how birds navigate. And in the caption in the picture says, Endangered whooping cranes learn a migration route by following an ultralight aircraft. Some birds migrate in a flock. You may have seen Canada geese flying in the sky in the form of a V. Young birds follow their parents and learn the route that the older geese have traveled before. They may follow a river and remember what it looks like. Certain sounds or smells will stay in their memory. Also, like captains on sailing ships long ago, birds use the position of the sun and the stars as a compass to find their way. Birds and many other animals also use Earth's magnetic field to navigate. Chemicals in these animals' brain allows them to sense the magnetic field and travel in the right direction. But scientists are still researching how this happens. They think some birds may actually be able to see the Earth's magnetic field. Canada geese fly in the form of a V using their memory, the position of the sun and stars, and the Earth's magnetic field to navigate. Returning home. After leaving the river, the Pacific salmon lives in the ocean for the next few years. Eventually, though, she begins her return journey. She is going home to the stream where she was born to lay eggs or spawn. How does a salmon remember the route she took years before and find her way back? Scientists don't know all the answers, but here's what they think is happening. A Pacific salmon feels the temperature of the water and the ocean currents. She tastes how the saltiness of the water changes in different places. She sees the location of the sun and the star patterns at night, like a migrating bird. She can sense the Earth's magnetic field to find her way. Finally, the salmon remembers the smell of her birthplace. The plants that grow and the leaves that fall from the trees create a special order for each stream. She swims up over the rocks and rapids on her last journey. She will lay eggs to create the next generation of Pacific salmon. Then she will die, leaving her fry to make their own journey using instinct and navigation skills they inherit from their parents. Each year, thousands of salmon return to the waters where they hatched. They use many clues to find their way back. This is the end of Animals on the Move. Tomorrow we will again read Animals on the Move, but we will also have our poetry place tomorrow, and we will explore some of the activity central activities. Once you've completed this video, if you feel like you have a pretty good grasp on the story, you can go ahead and pause your video and then work on your reader's notebook assignment. Today the reader's notebook assignment is pages 363, 364, and 365. In order to find these reader's notebook pages, you're going to have to open up your reader's notebook. You're going to have to go to the back of your reader's notebook under lesson 26 and you can see up in the top corner here that it tells you what lesson you're in, lesson 26 reader's notebook, and it tells you animals on the move. And the stories that you're working on is they're listed in the corner there. So we're on page 363 and I'm going to give you directions on how to complete this page first and I will work through 364 and 365 before our class meeting. It says word parts, com, con, pre, and pro. Write the basic word that could go in each group. And when it tells us we want words that could go in each group, what we're looking for are what we would call similes or things that have a similar meaning. And our first one says expectation or possibility. And what you're going to do then is you're going to look at your spelling list here and you're going to go through the words and find a word that fits with expectation or possibility. And in this case, we would read down our list and we would find that we have the word produce, company, protect, preview, contain, combat, prejudge, commotion, contest, prefix, progress, computer, confide, convince, prospect, confirm, preflight, provide, propose, 
promotion, and the challenge words concurrent, conscious, commercial, and complete. And we're looking for a word that has a similar meaning to expectation or possibility. And that would be to prejudge. Okay, so if you prejudge something, you have an expectation about something. Okay, or you think something about a specific topic or idea is going to be a particular or certain way. And so what you would do is you take the word prejudge and you would write it on the line for number one. And you guys have your actual paper, so you're just writing it down right in your reader's notebook. And I'll give you directions for turn in on Friday. So we'll be working throughout the reader's notebook until Friday. Then you'll go down to number two and it says a competition or a tournament. Well, if you look through your words, a competition or a tournament. And in this case, competition or a tournament, you could look down and you could see the word contest. A competition or a tournament is a contest. And you would write the word contest on line two. If you have any questions after you have finished working through these, you can make sure that you ask them in the class meeting. We're going to go ahead and move on to page 364 so you understand the spelling word sort. The spelling word sort, it says, write each basic word next to the correct word part. And so what you're doing here is figuring out which words begin with com in the first one, which ones begin with con in the second table, which words begin with pre in the third, and pro in the fourth. And it's broken up by basic word and challenge word. So I expect you to go through your entire list, including the challenge word, and write in the words with those beginnings. For example, com, you would go down your list, and you would see that commotion starts with C-O-M. So you would write the word commotion next to basic words, in the section. Sorry, it's hard to write with my finger on the tablet, so it doesn't fit very well, but you'll be able to do it with your pencil on your actual paper. In your second one, you're looking for words that begin with con, and we would go down. You can find the word confide there, or contain is also above it, so you can do any confine. And the next one is pre, and you would look through and you would see that we have prefix, and you would write the word prefix. And then pro, an example of pro, would be protect. Begins with pro. And you need to work through and you need to get every word on the list. So all 25 words need to be sorted into the table and written into the table where they belong. On the bottom it says, ch it says challenge, add the challenge words to your word sort. We are doing those right into there. And the spots for challenge words you'll notice are only in under com and con because your challenge words all start with either com or con. On page 365 we have a page called proofreading for spelling and it says find the misspelled words and circle them. Write them correctly on the lines below. One of the things I want you to think about as you're doing this is the words that are misspelled are only going to be words that are in your spelling list. And so you're looking specifically for words in your spelling list. If they're spelled incorrectly, you're going to circle them and then on the line below you're going to write them correctly. The way that this I usually do this is I usually read it through first and then pull out the words that I know are my spelling words and make sure they are or not spelled correctly. The scientist family read was terrified. Hey, I don't see any spelling words in that sentence. There had been no preview in the pre-flight plan that showed the huge waterfall and river which their vehicle needed to cross. Well, I know there I have preview and pre-flight. And if I look at my spelling list, I can see that preview is spelled incorrectly, and I can also see that pre-flight is spelled incorrectly. So I'm going to circle those two words, preview and pre-flight, and I'm going to write them on the line spelled correctly. Preview and pre-flight.
and then you're going to work through until you find all 10 misspelled words in your spelling list. Once you've completed this chunk, you are done with your reading and grammar and spelling activity for the day. We will again get on and have our class meeting where you can ask any questions you might have about today's reading lesson. Have a great day.